talked about reconciliation uh, because um, with all of the basics that Redemption Truths deals with, I think that reconciliation is one of those things that in the minds of many Christians is sort of a basic thing in the sense that it's not really understood in the realm that it really is. And I want to talk about that, show you a contrasting um, uh, viewpoints that some people have. And then I want to definitely get into the scriptures and just begin to uh, sort of examine. And then I think that, and I also think that it goes along with kind of some of the things that the Lord's been sharing with us this year in wanting us to be more uh, grounded and stable and um, uh, and therefore less afflicted. <laughs> well, I don't know what the right words are, but you do know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you do know what I'm talking about. All right, so our topic is reconciliation. And um, if you look in uh, Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verse 11, and you know what, this is, I, I had a feeling I was going to be so worn out, ah, I left them, okay, we'll just do with them, see it's the Lord saving me from not having to be seen with glasses, which I only wear mm -hmm. once every three to six months. But I just, when I get tired, I just can't, I don't want to focus. You know what I mean? It's like, I don't even want to try. Verse 11, wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by them which are, which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time you were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Okay, so <clears throat> this is sort of a bleak picture that he's painting of the Gentiles and sort of a um, um, glorified picture that he's painting of the Jews. Um, I don't know if you paid that close of attention, but I mean, he's, he's, he's speaking to the Gentiles here, that you in time past were this and that. You were the, called the uncircumcision, but we are the circumcision. At that time, you were without Christ, and you were alien, aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Okay, well, how many of you are Gentiles here? Raise your hand. Okay. You're still sort of alien from the commonwealth. I mean, like, you know, you get the point. And, and Paul's going to clarify this here shortly. Um, and um, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world, and sort of saying, we Jews now, we had covenant with God, and we da-da-da-da. <clears throat> but before he gets through, he's going to identify both Jew and Gentile as those who need to be reconciled. <clears throat> um, he sort of paints a picture like, well, we're, since we're Israel, we are with God, we have all this stuff, but then he's going to really hone in on the thing that really makes us reconciled to God. <clears throat> all right, so verse 13 but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once afar off are made nigh, are made near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances to make in himself of two one new man, thus or so making peace. And that he might, and there's that word, reconcile both unto God in one, in one body, by the cross, 
having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to them who were near. You see, who, he, who Jesus came and preached peace to was to those who were afar off, which were Gentiles, and to those who were near. Because there is a nearness spoken of in verse 13 that we just read that is nearer than what the Jews had, okay? But now in Christ Jesus, you who were afar off are now made nigh by the blood of Christ. And so there is that. And then verse 18, for through him are bo uh, we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. <clears throat> All right, and then let's see. Let's, let's just go ahead and read verse 19. The rest of it is significant too, but let's stop it with verse 19. Now, therefore... You are no more strangers and sojourners, but fellow citizens with the saints of the household of God. Notice how all of a sudden this has changed. This isn't talking about now you're, you are citizens of the commonwealth of Israel or um, you are part of this thing. You, you've been brought into Israel, but rather you and Jew and Gentile have been brought into Christ. All right. Now, the picture, the picture a lot of times that we get of reconciliation is sort of like what I've drawn on the board here. God here, Jesus at work down here, Gentiles and Jews. And so Jesus sort of comes in between, and by coming in between, he sort of works out a plan, a covenant. He does something, uh, you know, he, he does something miraculous whereby Jew and Gentile now are reconciled with God, okay? And so the, the picture that we usually get with that is if you just had two people standing here in front of me or beside me and, and, and they were enemies, you know, one of them's last name was Hatfield and the other one was, well, McCoy, yeah. And, uh, and they didn't get along. And so Jesus, Jesus would step in between them and he'd talk some sense into them. I mean, I'm, I'm telling you the, the, the sort of the understood idea of what reconciliation, not what the Bible just showed us, okay? That Jesus comes in and he works a covenant and he works a plan and he does some stuff and he gets us all dwelling together and getting along, okay? <clears throat> and in reality, that's not what he did at all, and part of the reason is because we've been talking about uh, justification. We've been talking about God's righteousness and that God, you know, there is, there is not a plan that's going to make God okay with sin, okay? I'm, are you following me? Okay. He's, he's not going to change his being. It's not even a change his mind. He, he, he would have to change who he is. He, he doesn't change on that because of his righteous side, and, I, and that's a poor way of saying it, but I, it, you understand what I'm trying to say. But by that love that God is, God is love, he worked a plan. He accomplished something that no amount of trying to get people to bargain and get together could ever, ever do. And this, these scriptures begin to describe that. <clears throat> and um, let's see, in verse 13 again, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once were afar off are made nigh by the blood. Okay, usually the way we read that is, but by Jesus, but now Jesus has done something by his blood. But in fact it's saying but now in Christ Jesus you who were once far off or not because of two things number one he uh, well let's just you can see it in verse 15 he abolished something and in verse 16 he slayed something do you see it you see him there in the scriptures those both of those factors and those factors are very important to the story. Those factors are very important to the picture because if you don't, if you, if you read abolish 
and slain is the same thing, then you'd be wrong because he's not talking. He, he didn't slay the law. But verse 15 says, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, there he abolished something, but not in, again, the traditional sense. This is where we have to hear the word of God, and we have to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church about Christ. And so, um, so we would assume that the, to abolish the law means that Jesus came and said, okay, the law is no more valid. You don't have to be under the law. Uh, you don't have to have anything to worry about with the law. Um, it's no longer a factor. Go steal, go kill, do whatever you want. The law is abolished. Okay. Um, which is not the case. Which is not the case. And Jesus said, what was it? Heaven and earth will pass away before one jot and tittle of this law passes away, okay? The, he, didn't do, he didn't abolish it in that manner. He didn't abolish it by just decreeing that it was no longer valid. I'm just going to sort of do something different. He abolished it in his flesh. Do you see the wording there? He abolished it in his flesh. Okay, well, there's several different ways of looking at that. One is uh, you, could, you could say, well, in his incarnation as he walked the earth, you know, somehow in his flesh he abolished it, but he didn't. Uh, you could say that um, in, in his flesh when he went to the cross, he abolished it. Yes, but bigger, bigger picture than just somehow magically going to the cross and abolishing it. Or you could say that it's abolished based on us being bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. And now the bone and the flesh is submissive to the inward law of the nature of God instead of an outward external law on tables of stone they've been written on the inside of us, and now in his flesh they are abolished. And, and just, to, just so that you can see that this, what I'm saying could possibly be the case, is verse 10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Okay? Um, created in Christ Jesus what does that mean? Well, that means we be, we're in Christ. That means that he's in us. That means that we're his body. That means that we're bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. And that means that his nature and his spirit, because, okay, I mean, you have to consider this thought of, of the law. I mean, let's just draw a little picture of that. I'll just draw the commandments right here. And we can say, that the law, um, we can look at that law and we can say, okay, God is presenting, God is presenting that law to us, and He says, keep it. Okay, that's that's the old covenant. That's the uh, the movie, the Ten Commandments. That's whatever you know. God says, here, take it and do it. All right, but. But you have to ask questions. Why is that law so important to God? Why? Why is that a big deal to him? I mean, why, you, know, you know, thou shalt not steal. I can think of a, a ton of worse things than, you know. I mean, not that I'm into stealing, but I'm just telling you. I, you know, I can think of a lot worse things. I mean, it never said thou shalt not rape or thou shalt, you know, there's, you know, thou shalt not use weapons of mass destruction and just, you know, like that. I mean, it was like, you know, I mean, we can, we, we can go on and on and on, you know. Um, it, it says, you know, and back then, what, you know, what would you steal, you know? I mean, you know, you stole my pencil, I mean, or something, you know. I mean, they're, they're cow or they're whatever. <clears throat> okay, so the question is, why is that so important to God? Okay, you say, well, it's important to God because he's righteous and he doesn't want you to do bad stuff. Well, I, you know, 
you know, anybody ever see that movie where Moses comes out and he's holding, you know, three tables of stone and he says, God gave me these three, and he drops one and breaks and says, two, these, that's it, 15, these 10 commandments, you know, because <laughs> he dropped one and broke it and he's, you know, yeah, oh, never mind, these 10. <clears throat> um, yeah, you know, why is that such a big deal to him? Well, I'll tell you exactly why. Because, and you see a picture of that in the, in the tabernacle. In the tabernacle, which represents the body of Christ. And inside of that is the, the, the um, Ark of the Covenant. And inside of the Ark of the Covenant is the Ten Commandments placed. And that's where they're kept. And if you lift that lid and you look in there, what happened to when they were bringing the ark back and they stopped along the way and then some of the guys decided, to, I wonder what's in here. Ah! <laughs> that's because they were confronted with the law apart from being in Christ as his nature. Okay? You see that? Now, yeah, here's another angle so it can help you think through that. If this law was that big a deal and, and God felt it was such a strong thing, then is he subjected to it? You understand what I'm saying? I mean, is, he, is there ten commandments that he goes, okay, I do these faithfully every day, or I don't do them. You know, I do these and I don't do that. You know? and, but if, if, he, if God was subject to to those things, then they would be God. You know, there's something higher than God. Okay, but it's not out here external to God. It's the law of his nature. It's the law of his nature. I, I remember when the Lord showed me that I was in Bible school and I remember seeing that and then think, and realizing Oh, the way that we're supposed to read this when Christ is your life, I mean, when, when you actually began to have Christ formed in you in these areas, then you would read it, you know, I shall not steal. I won't because it's his not life. You know what I mean? Not, not thou shall not, but thou shall not because Jesus is going to fulfill them. Okay. Now, had there a been a law given that could have given life righteousness would have been by the law but this cannot give life these ten commandments or the law cannot give life and life was the issue and specifically tree of life the cross Christ crucified however you want to see it specifically that's what God always had in mind that that would be on the inside. And, and didn't he say that? I, a new covenant I will make with you after those days, I'll put it on the inside of you. Isn't that basically, I mean, isn't that the basic tenets of the new covenant? I'll put it on the inside of you. I will, I will, I will, instead of thou shalt, thou shalt, thou shalt not. You know, and that's the difference, okay? And I don't believe, you know, and this is my opinion, and not everyone would necessarily agree with me, and nor do I want everybody to agree with me, but... You know, I don't believe that God is near as worried about our failures to manifest Christ, whether it's, whether it's not stealing a pencil or, or just, you know, our attitude. Or what. I don't think he's near as upset and worried about those things as we are. I think we get all freaked out because they start becoming sort of external to us, like Ten Commandments, even that, even that reality. Of trying to produce Christ. Well, good luck with that. You know, you can't produce Christ. You know, the fact that you would try to produce Christ would mean you're still alive. Okay. But in reality, in reality, you cannot possibly still be alive. You are crucified with Christ. We're talking about the finished work now. We're not talking about the manifestation of that. And, and if you don't hold on to that, what do you got? Well, I, I'll tell you what you got. You got you trying to be Jesus, and you'll never do You know what I mean? You'll never measure up, okay? Um, we always say, well, there's none perfect, you know, but God. There's none perfect but Jesus, okay? 
Well, how many people do you know who have fully decreased so that it's just Jesus in us? Yeah, that's right. And even in you, folks, I mean, I don't even know how to explain this to you, but you're, you will always be an earthen vessel. You, do you know that? I mean, you will all, always be his vessel, and the earthen part doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have a corruptible body. It means that you're flaky. You know, okay, well, you know, I mean, you know, I don't know how you are. I, I you know, like with my wife, when, when she messes up or stuff like that, I don't get all upset with her and, you know, roll over the top of her like a tank. Some, even sometimes the big mess ups I just kind of look and go isn't she cute you know what I mean I mean because I'm not looking for perfection you know I'm I know Jesus is in there I know I know that you know we're one I know that you know there's only one husband in here other than me right now so Jim <coughs> But, you, but I'm trying to make a spiritual point here and not ruin y'all's marriage over there. <clears throat> um, and that spiritual point is, regardless of whether all husbands do that or not, I think that Jesus does that. I think that he looks at us and I think that he, he thinks, you know, they're, they're growing, they're trying, they, they're seeking you know, but they're not anywhere near the statue that I, statue that I, you know what I'm saying? They're not anywhere near that. Yes. Have you experienced this? Like that? Mm -hmm. That's been the really great part of it is that you get to hear the transformation that Now, that's a perfect example. Um, Mallory's using the example of Peter in that, you know, he denied the Lord three times, and then he comes and he says, Peter, feed my sheep. But, you know, he didn't come to him and say, get out, you idiot. You know what I mean? He said, you're going to be one of my main sheep feeders. <laughs> you know? And, you know, and Peter's going, I deal with fish, man. No, no, no. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's right. But he's, but he's totally, it's as if all of that didn't happen. Okay, where does that come from? Here we go. On the righteous side of God, does God just go, okay, I ignore those failures and da-da-da-da? Okay, no, he cannot possibly. So he, he had to do something on the love side that remedied that. And what did he do? Well, the truth is, Jesus, Jesus, see, before Jesus died on the cross, Peter's denying him, right? Amen. He goes to the cross and Peter dies with him. And so does Paul and me and you and everybody, right? I mean, that's, that's a fact. You're dead at that moment. So when Jesus raises from the dead and finds Peter, he doesn't go, dude, you messed up. He's going, you're forgiven. He said peace to him, didn't he? That's what he said to those guys in the upper room, peace. That's what these scriptures are declaring in, in three different places. That peace has come. The reconciliation is not like what I've drawn on the board here. It is, in fact, not a total removal, as some might understand, but it is a removal of Jew and Gentile and a moving them into Jesus. So he says that, he declares that over in Colossians. There is neither Jew nor Greek nor 
Gentile, there's none of that. Christ is all and in all. Okay, that's right there. Okay, that's right there. They are in him, but no longer as Jew or Gentile. No longer with, uh, well, I'm a male or I'm a female or I'm, uh, I'm a Jew or my culture is this or all of that. I mean, you know, and, and I, I'm sure I can get in a lot of trouble for, for saying what I'm about to say, but uh, I'll, I'll just preface it with, you know, ever since I've been a Christian, I've had Jewish believers come to me and, you know, once they would hear my name, they go, you know, you, you, you know that's a German Jew name. You know that's Jewish, don't you? And I go, yeah, yeah, you know, whatever. And, well, I mean, you know, because uh, I was seeing Jesus from the very beginning, you know. <laughs> and so they're going, look, you could be very effective. And then, you know, I got invited to several, um, uh, what do you call them? Um, no, what? <laughs> No, messianic, mess, uh, messianic, yeah, and, you know, they're wearing the robes, and they're doing all of this and all of that, and I, you know, that, to each his own, I'm with Paul, and that's not even my own, you know, I, in other words, I forsook my Jewishness to be to, to declare Christ in me or me in Christ. You know, and they and many of them would say to me, well, you can really use this. I mean, these American Christians, they're just nuts over Jews. Just tell everybody you're a Jew. No, I've, I've been told that. They will support you. They'll do all that. I said, well, they don't want to support me because of Jesus. Forget it. And they're going, you know, God blessed you with a wonderful gift, a heritage that you could use for his kingdom. And I'm going, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There's none of that. Christ is all in the, and it's, and you know, it doesn't mean that you're not a, a male or a female. It doesn't mean that you're not that, but it means that Christ is the thing that people are meeting more than all that other stuff. Does that, does that make sense? I mean, it's because if he's all and in all, then that's all. I don't know how to put it, you know. And so he increases in you, and whatever you are in terms of, of race or, or culture decreases with an increase of Christ. Now, okay, if you went to many of those people and say that, I, somebody said, you know, I, I just wonder why people pick on, this is why, because I say stuff. That's why people don't like me. But, <laughs> you know, I'm not befuddled anymore. I finally figured it out. I say stuff, and I, I realize in the middle of saying it that I could be crucified for it. You know, uh, Doug Fisher, I, I'm sure he's not on there, but he was the world's best at this. I would, we would do conferences together, and I'd get up there and preach, and I'd sit down, and he goes, Randy? You know, you're going to be crucified for that. <laughs> well, thanks, Doug. But, you know, we, um, if you went to, to a Messianic Jewish church or whatever, you went to here, uh, not, I'm not picking on the Jews or whatever, or any place like that, and you just simply presented this. You just said, like, like if you were called up front to say a few words, and you went up there and you said, you know, Thank you, Lord. I just love Jesus. And here's my heart's desire for him to increase and me to decrease. And, and how many of you feel that same thing? You'd get this, yes. Amen. Is that right? All right. But then you start being specific. <laughs> then people are going to get upset. Well, well, wait a minute. I don't. And here's the sad thing is that not, most Jews, most Christians don't really realize that those are no longer the issues because the covenant changed. The covenant changed. And they don't know that. And so, and you know, I could really go, I mean, trust me, you think this is anything. I, I, in the New Testament, 
I could blow people away with some of the things the Lord has shown me. And it's clear cut and undeniable. It's not one verse. It goes and it develops, it develops this truth. But the way it is in the New Testament and the way it's developed would, would cause, it would cause people to hate you. And, you know, I mean, what I would want to do is hold up the Bible and go, wait, wait, is that, I mean, is this what it's saying? But we make golden calves out of things, and we grab things like, you know, I was saying someone told me you could really capitalize on this. We go, hey, I can use this. I can work this. I can... No, you can't. Not if Christ is your life. You cannot. You, 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 you will hate self-promotion. You only want to promote Jesus. You want him glorified. You know, and somebody says, well, you know, if you're well known and you're respected, then you can better glorify Jesus. <coughs> hmm. Let's see. Did Jesus glorify the Father? You know, and at what point did he glorify him? It was at the cross, you know? And that, you know, because he did that, therefore thou art highly exalted and given a name. Because he didn't speak up. He didn't justify himself. He didn't try to make, he didn't try to capitalize on it. He was, you know, what I have shared, he was the least. He made himself the least, not the greatest. And when, when he would do things, you know, do a miracle, he would tell them, don't tell anybody. He wouldn't say, this is my opportunity. This, you know, now the disciples, I'm sure did. I'm sure they said, man, we need to spread this around. This is big stuff. You know, we'll be big in no time. You know? Yeah, that's right. And so, but Jesus didn't. And, and, you know, you get that picture in Philippians 2, you know, 6 through 8, where he just keeps going, going down, down, down until he's crucified. But you see, Jesus, the way he is, he looks at us, and he sees us measuring people like, I will, I will not have anything to do with that person because it's not going to forward anything for me. There's nothing in it for me to just love. So, and it's actually a waste of time. So I won't give my time to them. Oh, but this person, they have, they can pull strings and they can do things for me. And so I'm going to give my time and attention and flattery, even if it be ever so small to them uh, because I'm working it. Okay, I'm working it. <clears throat> All right, so Jesus says, you know, if you, if you do those things to the least, you've done it to me because I'm, I came as the least and that could, if that was me, you'd be doing yes. it to me. Yes, there it is. Because... <laughs> I made myself of no reputation and got low and all this stuff. And so by doing it to them, you would absolutely do it to me. So if you've done it under the least of these, you've done it under me. See? And, you know, we're, we don't see it all in Christ. We don't see that the only claim to fame we have is Christ. We don't see that, that, that um, <clears throat> the loss is a wonderful loss instead of a, a horrible loss. That it is that, that with every loss we gain, with every decrease there's an increase, but the, but the gain is Christ and the increase is Christ and the glory goes to the Father through the Son and, and we're just a vessel of it and we can't grab any of the glory in, a, in the process. And, and, you know, Jesus, you know, <clears throat> people, there are people who are always trying to get you know, get hold of the glory, of, get, get it under themselves, you know, to gain, to squeeze out some glory for themselves, no matter how small it may be. I remember when we were on, when we were on Bolivar and, 
and a person uh, gave a, a fairly nice sum of money to the church. And, uh, you know, I try to give honor to whom honor is due, but I also, and, and Mallory said it at her little birthday party when we were all saying good things about her and stuff like that, she said, well, you know, I guess I got all my praise here in the earth, you know, that just blew that. Yeah, now I got more to work on. And I have been known and people have been upset with me because I didn't honor them before everybody, but I did that as unto the Lord so that they would get, you know, I, I figured they'd rather stand before the Lord and get that from him than some penny any little thing I would do. You know, and and I really am that way. I mean, it's there. You know, it's not that I am insensitive. <laughs> it is that I try to do the best that will work for you. But nonetheless, <clears throat> this person gave this sum of money, and um, and so uh, they they'd given it to me. I think the day before, and so the the church service was there on Sunday, and I didn't say anything about it. Oh my God. They caught me in the hall after the church was over with and raked me over. Well, what? You know, I gave all of that to help this church and to bless this church, and you don't even say anything about it. And da, 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 da. I mean, they just went over, and I, I said, you know what? Excuse me. I'm going to go in here and get your money back and give it to you. Cause, because, I, you know, I don't think people really know. Many people don't know me, okay? They don't know what I'm really like. I don't care about money. If it's if it's blood money, I don't want it. If it if it's if it's life and it came out of Jesus and it flows with that, I'll take it because it's a, it's it, we're all in one flow of life together. Does that does that make sense? And I don't think a lot of people really understand how I operate, which seems weird, you know. To them. I, I understand that it does, but. But I am, I am not going to, you know, that's why we've had people come in here and they wanted to be promoted real quick and they wanted to be seen and known and stuff like that. And, you know, I am very slow to lay hands on anybody. Y'all know that, man. I don't, you know, I don't, you know, you know, anoint anybody within two days or two weeks or two months. In fact, it's more like two years to even, you know, <clears throat> And I let the Lord bring them in instead of me going, well, we got, you know what we got here? We got a financial bundle of money in this person, and we need to treat them really good, you know. I don't, homie don't play that. I mean, I, I just, you know, I do not operate that way. And I believe that, that if a person humbles himself, God will exalt them. But if they're kind of trying to claw their way up, can I do it? That's how it feels to God. When people are trying to claw their way up, you know, bugs his teeth, you know what I mean? <laughs> because they're trying to claw their way up instead of just getting lower and letting the Lord in his timing. Because if we, you know, if we get exalted and it's not his, not his timing, we've still failed. You know what I'm saying? We still failed. We've missed what God has in mind. And so, so what, is, what is the answer to this? Because what we've just been talking about for the last half an hour is, is really human nature and it's, it's never ending drive to be something or get something or you know, have some, you know, it's just, it just gnaws in, in mankind. What is the answer? Reconciliation is the answer. Being reconciled to God by Christ, by oneness, by coming, by being bone of his bone and having not the Ten Commandments, but the law written inside of us, which is the nature of Christ. Okay. All right, well, again, now, again, we'll try to end it with this then. How well developed is that in any of us? Not that well, including myself, compared to Jesus. Come on. I mean, he's so, he's incredible, you know? 
but the option is that I focus only on that and therefore constantly see a contrast between me and Jesus and see myself as a total failure. Does that make sense? That you, you, you know, you're not, you're not seeing yourself in Christ, you're not being reconciled in Christ and having been reconciled in Christ, walking in the reconciliation, you're still feeling separate because you're not measuring up to Jesus. You'll never measure up to Jesus in that sense. You can only be the vehicle of Jesus. And to, to do that, you have to get your eyes off of producing and get your eyes on the stability of what's true in him and who you are in him and how he views you. And back to what Mallory said about Peter. When Jesus came, he didn't, he didn't overlook sin. Peter was now two things, dead and alive. Dead to who he was, Mr. Fisherman. You're not going to be a fisherman anymore. You're going to deal with sheep. What do you think of that? I just want your nature, Lord. You, say, you know, well, I excel at so-and-so. Well, that's you. You know, those days are over. Amen. Okay. But now you can excel at releasing or, or, you know, my life. But that only comes again when there is, when you might fail all day long, and at the end of the day you can say, Jesus died for me to be in him and one with him, and he put me to death, and he also is my resurrection and my life, and if I never manifest it, I rejoice and glory in the Lord now because it's still true. And on a good day, when it seems like the Lord's coming out of you, you still don't glory in the Lord that's coming out of you. You glory in the Lord. He that glorieth, let him glory at the Lord. No. <laughs> I glory at you. <laughs> Well, that's what most Christians are doing, glorying at him. <laughs> glory, glory. He's going, stop glorying at me and start glorying in me, you know? Because they'll be, as surely as you have a good day glorying in the worship service, you're going to have a bad, you're going to come into a service and you're going to have dental work done and hernias and everything else. And it's going it, to, and you're not going to feel like anything but the truth is the truth is the truth. And the worst thing you could do is deny the truth. Don't deny the truth as it is in Jesus. It didn't say don't deny the truth of Jesus. Don't deny the truth of his doctrine. It didn't say that. It says the truth as it is in Jesus. And that's our truth. When, when you talk about that truth... That's our truth because we're in Jesus. And, and his heart is settled on this, and it's, it's done. He, he'll never look back. He will always consider us one with him. And as I said, the only thing that can break that is our faith, and the only reason why our faith would break that is we've gotten our eyes back on ourselves and, and how far short we come. Well, we all still come short of the glory of God. You do realize that, don't you? In ourselves and with our efforts and with our desire and, and, and every beating heart of love that we have because we want to glorify the Lord, it's still not what God wants you to be focusing on. He wants you to just rest, enter in. Isn't that the words? Enter into rest. So that would mean that Jesus is the Sabbath. Well, doesn't he say right here he's also our peace? Because peace is when you've been reconciled with God. And Jesus is your peace because through him you're reconciled to God. So he, he's, he didn't give you peace and he didn't make peace with you. You know, he didn't smoke a peace pipe or something. He, he, he first put you to death, and then he joined you in resurrection as his body, 
and he is now your peace. And that's why, you know, if you, if you, whether in prayer or you stand before the Lord one day and, you know, well, what do I say, you know, what, you know, you point to Jesus and you say, I'm in him. He's my peace. Well, I'm reconciled to you through Christ, not by Christ. The scriptures say through. Through Christ. Then all glory goes to the Lord. And then peace does come into you. The peace that he is fills you because he fills you. He's your life. He, you're a branch. And all of a sudden, everything starts coming down to being Christ. And it, it, while it sounds, you know, it sounds crazy in the, in the Christian religion, it doesn't sound crazy in the scriptures. <laughs> you know, I mean, it does. I, I remember it sounding crazy to the Christian religion. Well, you, you, you know, you just want to make everything Jesus. Christ is all, and you know, hmm, you know, he's the beginning and the end, the first, the last, the length, the breadth, the height, and the depth. Well, you just want to make Jesus everything. You want to make him the Sabbath and your peace? No, I don't want to make him that. I just want to acknowledge him as that because the word of God declares him to be that. Hallelujah. I st- I stand on the word of God. I stand that, that, word, that those scriptures are declaring the truth as it is in Jesus and the heart of God and his view of me. And, and <clears throat> you know, the, 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 the one thing I'm blessed about is, and I'll try to end with this, is that w- when Jesus showed up after the resurrection, the last time Peter saw Jesus, he denied him three times. When Jesus shows up, <laughs> Peter throws himself into the water and swims to him and, you know, gets there and just, he doesn't run from the Lord. Well, I'm separate. I failed. That's that's so much the modern day understanding of when when you fail that you're now separate from God. You know, the scriptures say in the Old Testament, can can, can a mother leave her suckling baby? And then, and then the Lord goes, because he knows that that's strong in a woman, but nonetheless, he goes, well, even if you do, the Lord will not leave you. <laughs> I love that. He goes, you know, I'll use one of the strongest examples I can give, but you know what? Even if you did do that, I'm not that way. And I, you know, and Jesus said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. Well, I'm going through hard times and I don't feel you. He didn't say I'd, wouldn't, you know, give you goosebumps. He said, don't worry, I'll never let you not have goosebumps. <laughs> he said, I'm with you. You know, was, was he with uh, Betsy and her sister in uh, the prisoner of war camps? The whole time. Was he with the people, the Jews that were in there with these Gentiles that got thrown in? Yes, she... <laughs> She would have prayer meetings and sharing times with them. And you hear Jews even today say, where was God? Right here. Just like he always wants to be, incarnate in the flesh. He wants to be word made flesh in us. But that's not a feeling, and that's not a bunch of nifty scriptures and explanations of those scriptures popping out of our mouth. It's just the reality. Christ is here. He's in, you know. I've told people that, that, you know, they say, well, you know, I hope that Christ shows up for this conference. I said, well, he'll show up because I'm going to bring him. (laughs) (laughs) And they thought that was egotistical, but it wasn't about me. You know what I mean? If I'm going to be there, he's going to be there because he's my life. Yes, Carolyn. Right.
No, no, we don't. I remember some of y'all were with me way back when, when, you know, in Denton, we had this place for the NORAD or whatever, you know, up here on the hill. And, you know, and of course, yeah, and uh, if uh, they ever bombed, you know, when Russia and the Cold War was going on, they ever bombed, people said, well, one of the places that they would bomb would be Denton because of the, the thing. And, and, um, and people are always going, man, you know, I don't, I don't want to be here when that happens. You know, I think I'll move to a city where it doesn't have any stuff. I said, if they nuke all of the major cities and bomb sites in our country, I don't want to live. I don't want to try to live through that mess. Just take me home to be with the Lord. You know, the mentality was completely the opposite, and they're just going, I just want to live. And I said, really? You know, with the deformed and the head, no food, and <laughs> radiation. <laughs> I'm just kind of going, hey, see them zombie movies? It ain't going to be me. I'm going home with Jesus. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's right. All right, let's, let's stop and take a little break.